Okay, so well, we're going to to start, right? Uh, well, first of all, it's my pleasure to to introduce you, uh, Jim or James Di Carlo, right? Uh, he's going to give us a really interesting talk about reverse engineering the human brain mechanisms of object perception and object learning. Uh, well, they give they gave me a really long biography because uh, Jim is a really important person. So, but I'm going to say a small thing. Uh, Jim Di Carlo is a professor of systems and computational neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he research teams' primary goal is to discover uh, an artificially an artificially emulate the brain mechanisms that underlie human visual intelligence. Uh, it, Di Carlo served as head of uh, MIT uh, Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences from uh, 2012 and 2021, and he's currently the director of the MIT Quest for Intelligence, where he, he and his leadership team are working to advance interdisciplinary research at the interface interface of natural and artificial intelligence. So yeah, again, it's my pleasure to, to have here uh, uh, James or Jim. Um, that's all, right? So Jim, the floor is, is yours. Okay, great, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Can I get a thumbs up that we're good? Yeah, yeah, okay. I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Again, uh, thank you for inviting me virtually here. Um, and this talk is really meant to be as interactive as you guys want and can be as informal as you want. I tried to make the material not fill up the whole 50 minutes. Um, a bit of disclaimer there. I mean, even though my title, I'd hope to talk more about not just object perception, but object learning or learning of new objects. And I, when I put the talk together, I realized I'm not going to have time to do that and still give you guys a sense of the overall kind of goals here and, and some examples of progress. Um, so maybe that's a talk for another day. So um, I apologize if those of you are coming to, to hear a lot about object learning, because I'm not going to say that much about it today, but happy to say a few words in the discussion. Um, what I did try to do is put together a talk that will give you an overview, and I'll give you that outline in a minute. But I want to start by motivating a, a kind of something that I think might be obvious to many of you in the room, but it's not always obvious to a general audience, which is, OK, that's a human brain. And here's a quote from one of my favorite quotes from the late Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. And the quote reads, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Now, this quote is sometimes jarring for people because it's, it's basically a statement of materialism that, hey, we can understand who you are, everything you are in a sense of, in a sense of physics and how parts interact to give rise to who you are. Now, and I sort of believe in that materialist goal. I think many of you do believe in that. But I want to give you kind of a, a sort of a related quote here about this object here. I mean, I have an example on my wall here. If you see, I often show my students, this is an iPhone. It's a complex engineering device. And I don't mean to say your brain is an iPhone, but it's a complex engineering device. And here's a quote. Your remarkable favorite app, all its performance and amazing user interface are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of transistors. Now, I made up that quote, um, it says anonymous, but that was me, um, because it's basically making the same point that, okay, here's a machine. It gives this amazing performance. Um, and you could say that it's just a collection of transistors. And that is both true, but not yet useful. So uh, I want you to all accept that there's a mission that we're on together to understand the system on the left in engineering terms and how it gives rise to our minds. Um, but that to do that, we're going to need something more than uh, quotes at this level. We're going to need something something that explains how all those transistors give rise to the app that, or how all your neurons working together gives rise to who you are, your identity, your free will, and all of that. Okay, so I hope you can hold both those ideas in mind at the same time as a motivator. It also maybe helps to go one level down and say, well, let's think about a complex engineering device by like this phone. And we know, of course, it's based on transistors. They're there on the left. But there's a stack of things that are built on top of that and levels of abstraction to, give, to ultimately give rise to the thing we call our amazing user interface. By analogy, human cognition, which is really what we're after. The reason we study brains is not just because brains are interesting, but because they underlie interesting behavior and cognition, or what I'll call broadly intelligence. And somehow neurons, the sort of billions of neurons in your head and the trillions of synapses between them, somehow that connectivity gives rise as a device 
to all of these things that we call remarkable behavior and cognition. And we guess at levels of abstraction and systems of neurons and brain regions and, and algorithms that might explain that. And But our goal really as a field, I'd say brain and cognitive science is broadly construed, is to find what I'll call systems models that are able to link across these phenomena, at, link to, at least link from maybe neurons and their connections all the way up to complex behavior and cognition. And I'm gonna to try to give you an example of how that's been progressing in visual intelligence or visual cognition today. Okay, so again, this, just to hammer home a bit the philosophy, what kind of answers do we seek? So we're not after, in my mind, theories or you know deep kind of Maxwell-like equations. Um, of course, the brain follows that. We're after something else. And that something else is, again, motivated by the idea that emergent phenomena of human cognition are emergent from a specific set of mechanisms, a specific neural network interacting with the body. And what we're after is that this to understand these, we're going to need to, uh, to explain them in the same way that NG, any engineered complex machine, like an iPhone, are understood. The answers that we're going to come up with, at least the intermediate answers, will be reproducible engineer quality. That means transmittable and reproducible specifications of how the component parts in this case, the neurons in the body, interact together to produce the emergent phenomena, in this case, interesting behavior and cognition, or in my case, visual intelligence I'll talk about today. So really the goal is to find these machine executable system models that can link across those levels for us. And so that is, I think, the goal that I'm putting out to frame for what the kind of work you're gonna see from us today. And I'll try to motivate how we've been going about that goal and the payoffs that that goal has. And this will unlock these kinds of goals, I will argue, not just in visual intelligence, but in other areas of cognition will unlock new applications. And again, I'll try to give you an example of that. Okay, how are we going about this? Now here I'm wearing this quest for intelligence hat that I was mentioned at the introduction, which is a broader goal of taking, of, of achieving these kinds of engineered level models of how human intelligence works. I'll zoom into vision in a minute, but I wanna give you the overall strategy here, which at some high level is, is a little bit obvious here. We're gonna take experimental discoveries and measurements from natural sciences, by which I mean neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, we're gonna take uh, engineering sciences as the theory and synthesis of, of a possible models that might explain those phenomena, might link across those levels. And we're gonna put those things together into what we call integrated machine executable models of human intelligence here in the middle. That's the overall strategy, if you will. Those models serve two roles simultaneously. They serve as the leading hypotheses as the mechanisms of human intelligence. Like all hypotheses, they're gonna be incorrect. Like all models are gonna be incorrect in some ways. It will be an ever advancing front to make more and more aligned models of how natural systems are producing their amazing uh, behavioral abilities, their amazing cognition. Um, and these models beyond serving as hypotheses that, that then drives next, gen, next experiments. So that loop continues to build better and better hypotheses, better and better models, if you will. Those same models can serve as technology drivers on the computing side. So opening up new engineering possibilities, um, for instance, new AI-like applications that, that, that might lean on those models. It's not the only way to achieve AI goals, but it is a, a goal that can come out of this kind of approach. Okay, so what I'm gonna tell you about today is this general strategy and how it, we've used it in the area of visual intelligence or what I'll broadly call perception, especially visual perception, and some of the potential impacts of this model-focused strategy. Again, by model, I mean machine executable models, in this case, of visual processing. So I, I can't, this is the most important slide in my whole talk. Uh, the things I'm gonna talk about, much of the things I'm gonna talk about left, next are, are work from scientists that have are worked in my lab or have come through my lab. Um, and, and so I will try to acknowledge some of them along the way, but I want to acknowledge them up front that all the work I'm going to show you from my lap is really done by uh, the, these amazing women and men, and I'm really just an ambassador of their efforts. Okay, what I put together for you guys today was to try to first outline, for those of you who don't know much about vision, and I know this, this audience might be new to, to just hearing us, is just to explain to you the path on where our leading neuroscientific models of human visual object perception have come from and how we think about those models. And I'll spend the first 15 minutes or so explaining that, giving you background. So it's a bit of neuroscience, uh, visual neuroscience 101, just to get to that in just 15 minutes. Um, then I will spend most of the rest of the talk talking about a specific topic that I'll, is in the area of adversarial robustness as it relates to object perception. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, I'll explain it to you when we get there. I'll talk about neural, neural measurements related to this and behavioral guidance and how this leads us to think about certain kinds of health applications that the leading models might begin to unlock for us. And then we'll wrap up with some discussion. Okay, so let's talk about this leading scientific models of human visual intelligence for about 15 minutes. 
So again, the goal here is not, you know, broadly, I'd love to understand all of intelligence. I think all of us would like to understand that, all our amazing capabilities. Here, I'm going to focus on visual intelligence. So for instance, when you look at this image, you might recognize this first as a person, maybe also as a woman, I might imagine, recognize Madame Curie. There are something going on in your brain that's allowing you to do those kinds of processing. Um, of course, there's other things from this image that you could take, but this is a long-standing question in perception. How do we even know this is a person from these pixels and maybe even report the identity of this person? So for many decades, natural scientists, uh, including myself, have been studying the brain regions that are involved in this, taking apart the anatomy as sort of outlined above, and I'll zoom in on this in a minute, and the behavioral measurements that we refer to loosely as our phenomena of perception, how well we're able to, for instance, recognize this person. So we have both neural phenomena and behavioral phenomena that come out of studying things like responses to visual Im images like this one when questions are asked. Uh, and I'm going to say engineering scientists, scientists, especially computer vision, have, of course, been interested in processing this often to similar goals, for instance, to identify the person. And the big picture that I'm going to tell you today is by bringing those things together, by engineering systems that try to do this in the style that the brain might be doing it, this has led to some of the leading machine executable models of core visual intelligence. Again, the same slide I gave you a moment ago, moment ago just now oriented around the question of visual intelligence, especially what I'm calling core visual intelligence that I'll outline in a minute. So this is the big picture of where I'm taking you in the next few minutes to explain that general idea, but I hope you just keep this kind of visual in your head. Okay, so let's back up and tell you how did we get into this and tell you a bit about vision. So visual intelligence is a remarkable capability. You can just demonstrate that by looking at an image like this one. You're able to do things like say what's out there. There are cars. Where are the cars? What are the poses of the cars? There are people. There are signs. There are buildings. There are trees. You're able to say things like where is it safe to walk? And even plan actions around this just pattern of pixels hitting your eyes just even for a glimpse. Now, um, uh, the way you do this is not by simply staring at this image and digesting it, but you move your eyes around and sample the scene, maybe like a saccadic path like this one shown here. Each of these dots indicates a dwell position uh, where you might pause. And then the saccades are these rapid eye movements to shift your eyes, your high acuity vision at the center of your gaze to other points of interest on the image. Now, I'm not going to talk about the process of shifting your eyes and how that works. I'm just going to zoom in on what happens during that glimpse where those dots are, where you pause for about 200 milliseconds. That's what we've been focused on. Again, 200 milliseconds is a kind of, kind of a, a sort of a typical uh, human or monkey viewing time to pause and collect data, if you will, on your sensor, in this case, your eyes, um, to try to, uh, to analyze what's out there. I'm not going to talk about the full field of view, which is, uh, of, of course, many visual degrees of visual angle. I'm just going to talk about the central 10 degrees, where, which is where you have your highest acuity vision. If you want to think about 10 degrees, it's like two hands at arm's length. And if, if you analyze that, you realize a lot of your visual activity is actually going on in your central 10 degrees, even though the rest of our field of view is important. We're zooming in in space, 10 degrees, and time, 200 milliseconds. So I'm boxing in the visual intelligence problem to be much simpler than the one I motivated at the beginning, just to get us started. And as you'll see, this way of boxing, and it turned out to give us a lot of insight into the visual processing, not everything about visual intelligence, but a lot. And so we call this area core, this kind of, this operationally defined thing, core visual intelligence, which I'm defining as your capabilities that, are, that you can do within this sort of spatial temporal box, 200 milliseconds of visual input, central 10 degrees of visual of, of view. So for example, core object recognition allows you to answer questions like the position and pose of an object or the category of an object. Like in this image here, you might report, I see a car, here's its position in horizontal and vertical degrees or in, on the screen if you touched it. And you might even be able to identify its pose angle if you, if you had a, a knobs to, to, to report that to us. In fact, these are things that we've measured. Okay, that's just one example. Of course, there's many possible images to do this in. And I'm now going to shift to say I'm motivating humans, but I'm now going to put up this species here. This is the rhesus monkey, uh, and I'll motivate this a bit in a moment. The rhesus monkey here doing the, a task that is similar to one that we might ask you to do, where it's triggering a test image and reporting which category of object it thinks it sees in that image uh, by pointing left or right. Um, this case is not entirely controlled because you see the head is partly free. In the lab, we can control this much more much more precisely in terms of exactly what's hitting the eyes of the animal. Um, but you can, this is just to illustrate that these animals will readily do the same task that I might ask you to do to report the content of an image in just 200 milliseconds at your central 10 degrees. In this case, the content being the category report. I'm showing you now here the data from rhesus monkeys on the right, humans on the left. And all I want you to see, these are basically patterns of confusion among different objects. You see a list of objects on the left, 
Um, and, and, and the colors indicate the difficulty of discriminating among objects. Red is more difficult to discriminate than blue. Those details don't matter. All I want you to take from this slide is look how similar these patterns are for the rhesus monkey and us humans. Uh, and we've done this not just at the object grain, but at the image grain as well. And what this shows us is that our close cousins here, the rhesus monkey, have almost identical abilities to us to do things like report the object content in an image like the one I, the, the examples I just gave you. Now that might be surprising to you. Um, it's not surprising to biologists that there's conserved mechanisms there, um, but here we can show us a quantitative match. So we're not even trying to, here we're, we're, we're studying the rhesus monkey, not as a sort of generalized thing, like one might study a yeast to generalize to human genomes, we're studying the rhesus monkey as a as a as an artifact, if you will, that has the same abilities quantitatively as we do in this area. So, if we could build models of the rhesus monkey, those models generalize quite readily to our understanding of human processing as well. So that's why I'm explaining all that. The capabilities of humans and monkeys in the domain of core visual intelligence are almost identical, and that's one example assessment of that. I don't mean to imply that humans are monkeys in all cases, but in cases of visual processing, this holds quite well, which is why this is a good model, an animal model for the, studying these properties. Okay, why are we doing this in monkeys instead of humans? It's because we know a lot more about the areas of the anatomy of the monkey brain shown on the right. This is over decades of experiments, uh, a lot of anatomy, a lot of neurophysiology. I won't be able to cover all that, but there's the monkey brain on the right, the human brain on the left. And I want to sort of give you a big picture of how we think about the brain regions involved in visual processing. It's a set of visual areas called the ventral visual stream. Here I'm showing the cortical brain areas involved that again are collectively referred to as the ventral visual stream. They have both feed forward and feedback processing that I'll show you in a moment. We are especially interested in the highest level of the ventral stream called the infratemporal cortex. Um, it's critical for recognition tasks like the ones I was describing here. Lesions in IT result in deficits of recognition. Here's the monkey, here's a monkey brain. You can see a fixed monkey brain just for you to get a sense of that actual object. Um, here's the anatomy of the ventral stream now shown in a more um, a kind of biologically uh, accurate depiction. I wanna orient you to the left that of course information comes into the eyes of the retina is transmitted to the center of the, the brain and the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, a way station that then projects to cortical area V1 shown in red which then projects to a series of other cortical areas named appropriately V2 onto V4, and then a set of areas called the infratemporal complex shown here in yellow. The size of these areas shown on the right shows their relative numbers, their volume, if you will, on the cortical tissue, the volume in the brain. The colors zone indicates the central 10 degrees of processing where the where tissue is dedicated to the central 10 degrees. And you can see that much of our processing, both us and our primate cousin here is dedicated to the central 10 degrees, which might feel surprising to you, but that just speaks to how, how packed our photoreceptors are in the center of our gaze. And the processing is, is there behind it to do that. Okay, I'm also showing you the latencies of neurons in these different areas, just to orient you time scales here on tens of milliseconds for neurons responding to images presented to the eyes. And there you see the sort of onset latencies if I flashed an image and the onset images that follow. Okay, this is a bit of kind of orienting you to the monkey brain and the kind of areas that I'm gonna talk about concretely. I'm gonna say a bit now about the infratemporal cortex I've already mentioned, this complex of areas in yellow. Um, and just to orient you, the infratemporal cortex doesn't just, it's not the end of the processing pipeline. It projects to areas involved in the frontal areas involved in decision and action and around the bend to areas involved in memory and value judgment. I'll say more about those at the end of the talk because they, were, they start to relate to clinical applications. But you can think of this pathway as the sort of the highest level of, of visual representation, then in service of higher level cognition of the time and things that I've shown here. All right, so here's now an engineered like schematic of these areas. Again, following the anatomy I, I showed you before, just a different view of this at the bottom. Visual input comes in the left, processed through each dot is meant, meant to represent a neuron. There are millions of neurons in each of these areas. Of course, they're just schematically shown here. There's both feed forward and feedback processing and also recurrent processing within each area. You can think of conceptually when an image like this one comes on, there's a pattern of photon uh, phot photoreceptors activated in the back of your eyes, corresponding to the pattern of luminance on the image that's transmitted to a, that's transduced into a pattern of spiking activity in the back of your retina and a million, million, a set of million cells called the retinal ganglion cells that transmit spiking energy down the optic nerve to the LGN in an image that's basically one-to-one -one isomorphic with what's striking the eyes um, that's transmitted through the LGN. And then this series of cortical areas that I mentioned, V1, V2, V4, and IT. 
And, and then again, the latency is about 100 milliseconds for it, for energy striking the eyes to be transduced into energy activation of neurons deep in the brain. In this case, IT cortex, about 100 milliseconds in the monkey. Now, um, you can change the image. And of course, you will change the, the pipeline, what's happening across that pipeline, including its output stage IT. You'll get a new pattern of activity, a new set of neurons firing in IT, maybe partially overlapping the prior set, a new distributed set. If you go back to the original image, you will re-invoke the old pattern. So this is not a sort of random pattern coming out of the ventral stream. It's a very de deterministic process with a, with a bit of stochasticity around it. At least that's how we mostly model it. Um, and if you go to the back to the another image, you'll get a different pattern. So you can think of each image as producing a new pattern out of uh, the ventral stream. And those patterns, as I'll show you in a minute, are quite interesting uh, in terms of their power to support tasks like visual recognition. And the system can easily follow along at, at sort of rates like this, which you might notice is this is about 150 milliseconds, which is corresponding to roughly the rate at which you move your eyes that I mentioned at the beginning. So it's not surprising it can follow along. Okay, so that's IT cortex at the top of the ventral stream, a brief tour of monkey visual neuroanatomy and, and brief visual physiology. I'm going to show you a bit of data collected out of IT cortex and why we find this interesting. Just to orient you, these data are often collected in this case with chronically implanted microelectrode arrays where um, these are implanted during a sterile surgery into the cortical tissue shown at the bottom. Uh, the, uh, everything is sealed up. There are connectors on the animal's head that allow us to then record over many days or months, often from the same neural sites to measure their responses to various different images to essentially sample those patterns that in IT cortex that I've been showing here uh, schematically that we can actually make these empirical measurements in the non-human primate. Here's an example of what those data might look like. Here's the response in a, in a couple of non-human primates for a neural sample. This is a few hundred neural sites in response to one image that's shown at the top. Don't worry about the content of the image. Green means high response, black means low response. These are sort of spike rates, the numbers of spikes coming out over a time window of about 100 milliseconds, latency adjusted for IT cortex. And you can see there's a pattern of firing that emerges out of the IT cortex for this particular image. Again, some bright green, some dark. And you can just think of that as a distributed pattern of activity out of, of IT cortex. And here's another set of images. Here's eight different images that are also tested. And you can notice the patterns different with each image, sometimes overlapping with the other patterns. But you can think of each image, again, as producing a new population pattern. Here's a whole bunch of images. Here's 2,000 images we collected. And again, for these same neurons. And in this case, the, the bars indicate different categories of where those images came from. I'm showing you all this just to give you the high level view here that when we make these kind of recordings, not just we, but others record from IT cortex, um, what's been shown over decades is that these population patterns, they're not like photographs of what's on the image. They're much more powerful. So they allow, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that, is you do things like put simple linear decoders trained on, for instance, some of the images to say, hey, I think these are, exa these are example images of a face. And you can then use those same decoders to accurately predict for new images, generalized to new images, hey, there's still a face out there as an example. And you can do that for other categories like cars and trucks and some of the categories that you have listed here. And so when you, the upshot is when you do linear decoders and you show, you train them up on some data and you test them on new data, you will get the behavioral patterns out that look almost identical to the patterns that we get out of the human and monkey that I showed you earlier. Uh, both the patterns of confusion and errors and the, and the magnitude of performance that you get out of the system. So we take these linear decoders as approximating what the human and or the monkey might be doing downstream of its visual of its IT cortex to execute that task, like report Madame Curie in the example I gave you, report a face or report a car and its pose, for example. All of that is background work that I won't have time to dive into today. I just want you to realize that those patterns are quite powerful. They're one step away, one nice step away from being able to support a wide capability set of the type I've been outlining. Um, and just for the for the aficionados in the room, you might those are models, if you will. They are machine executable models, just like models I motivated. And what those models allow us to do is do experiments like if we manipulated IT neurons, we can make predictions as to how the perception should change. So if we were trying to inject percepts in IT cortex by direct neural activation, these models help us guide us on those kinds of goals. I'm not going to talk about that kind of work today. I'm going to shift to the broader goal of just getting back to like the overall processing of the ventral visual stream, which is again the areas I showed you here. 
And I just want to, you to know, if you didn't know this, that even though I put this anatomy up here, it really wasn't until about a decade ago that we had any decent models of how this visual processing was working beyond the first area of V1. So it was really a mystery until about 2013. And just of how these, these photons were converted to patterns of activity that then were transformed in some nonlinear way to these powerful IT patterns, that was a complete mystery before. Um, and it's not much of a mystery anymore. We still don't have perfect answers, but we have much better answers. And just to give you a sense of how those answers arise, they basically come from building models in the style of the ventral visual stream, which are deep convolutional neural networks, which you probably know well in the AI land. Those were originally motivated by work, especially in the anatomy and physiology of the ventral stream. Here's an example, deep artificial neural network that we used as a model of the ventral stream. It's just one example. And these, again, these are all derived from an original uh, first generation convolutional neural network family that I just mentioned. Um, but what, what changed in these models was around 10 years ago, um, we and others started to use optimization techniques to put an ethological constraint on these networks, try to get them to perform tasks. We were essentially doing kind of computer vision or AI engineering to say, let's make these networks do something that we think the monkey does, for instance, report car, person, or sign. And we used engineering techniques that many of you probably know well, including things like, like architecture search or stochastic gradient descent to optimize the unknown parameters of those networks to just get it to do that task well. And I say we, this work was mostly, mostly led by Dan Yamans and Ha Hung. Dan is, is at Stanford now, uh, if you want to follow a, a lot of recent cool work he's done since then. But what this allowed us to do is to produce now models that allowed it to be good hypotheses of what was happening in the ventral stream. And the reason we know that that was working is not just that we got the networks to perform behaviors, but we looked inside those networks. And again, this is about 10 years ago now. And we were able to show that individual neurons in the networks, or let's say weighted sums of those individual simulated neurons in the, in the network, in this case, IT, that were able to predict the data that we were observing in the monkey. In the bottom, you see in black the data from an IT neuron, and the red is the data from a model. IT, and this is a, just one particular model, and you can see that the prediction is quite good. Not perfect, but quite good at the even the image grain, which is what you're seeing across this plot here. Many, many images shown at the bottom. Okay, this is all background, and I'm sorry I'm going through it quickly because just the big picture here you should have is that these some of these models now serve as our leading scientific hypotheses. We think of them as machine executable systems level models that I mentioned at the beginning that allow us to go all the way from photons to things that are simulated neurons all the way up to perception. So they encompass that integrated goal of explaining how images give rise to perception and the neural patterns that we should see in between and the neural connectivity that should exist in between. And we make these, now we take these models as a class of models that we keep working in to say, which, let's find better and better models within this large family of deep convolutional neural networks to find the ones that best align with the biology that we're measuring. And the way we do that is by making comparisons like the one I just showed you. We make those comparisons at different levels of the system. IT should match IT, V4 should match V4, V2 should match V2. We take simulated neurons and we compare them with actual neurons. And there are a number of ways to do that I won't have time to talk about, but they give rise to measures of how well things align at the neural levels. And we also make measurements at the behavioral level here called perception. And those patterns that I showed you, for instance, out of the monkey and human, how well do the patterns come out of a simulated model? And to the extent those things line up, we're happy. To the extent they're not lining up, we say that's not the right model. We need to make a better model. And that cycle continues. We keep track of this as a community in a platform called BrainScore. BrainScore is a collection of all the scores that I'm describing here. Maybe those of you who are interested in these kind of models, I encourage you to go there. This is actually an old image of BrainScore that there's a new website up and uh, it's quite exciting that this is being expanded beyond just vision, but you might, some of you may be interested in going there to see the latest models, maybe even submit models of your own or maybe data of your own. Anyway, this allows us as a community to start to sort of converge around shared sets of alignment benchmarks, both neural and behavioral across a complicated system, in this case, the ventral stream. I'm now going to shift and foreshadow a bit the things I'm going to talk about next. BrainScore allowed us to see that some of the currently leading models used robustification methods during training. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. I'm just foreshadowing that here. The BrainScore is already telling us among the possible models, and I just showed you one example 10 years ago, among the possible current leading models, some of them were using a technique that was making them align best with the brain by a number of measures here. BrainScore, again, is a community. Please join us if you're interested. I already said this. Go onto the website. And it, this is not my lab. This is far bigger than my lab trying to work on this growing community. Okay. 
I want to now sort of sort of come back to this big picture and say, now that I've introduced you to models of the ventral stream and how that relates to questions of core visual recognition and visual intelligence broadly, you probably already know this, that some of those models, those deep convolutional networks became the leading computer vision models. They've been modified in many ways to drive a lot of AI applications. Of course, AI has progressed well beyond those kind of models, transformers and the like for language and other things that you probably know. But that was some of the initial successes on AI, again, about 10 years ago that motivated the neural networks uh, sort of new era, if you will. I want to focus you on the left side of this plot, which is how these models are now being used as the leading hypotheses of human core visual intelligence uh, that I motivated at the beginning. And, and this work continues today to continue to build new models and then to iterate and try to make them more aligned with the system. And again, I mentioned BrainScore as a, as a platform for doing that. Okay, that was all background and that might've taken a little more than 15 minutes. So I'm gonna try to do 10 minutes on each of these things to get you through some of the more recent things that that, that work has led us to. All right, adversarial robustness of object perception. Let's, this is now a more specific question that we can ask now that we have some of these models in hand. And now hopefully you know where they came from. So many people have been asking questions like, why is biological vision immune to adversarial attack? Or we might say, is biological vision immune to adversarial attack? Now, what is adversarial attack? Well, if you don't know what adversarial attack is, I'm gonna sort of introduce that here. Many ANN models of the ventral stream, like the ones I've been showing you so far, they have this strange failure mode. And this was pointed out a number of years ago, not, not by us, but by other folks, especially working in computer vision. And this was coined adversarial attack. And the basic thing goes like this. It's like, once you have a model, now you can take a clean image like this one shown here, and it normally gives the output frog and everybody's happy because that actually is an image of a frog. Um, but you can use the model to work back through the model to find a specific perturbation to the image, a slight modification of the pixels, like this example shown here. And that then you add that to the image and you get the new image at the bottom. And to you and I, we go, well, that still looks like a frog. It's a little fuzzier or something. But because this has been optimized against this particular model uh, with the model at hand, again, a machine executable artifact, a computer model, this model, this has caused this model to now change its output. That's how those perturbations were determined. Now the output of this thing says, okay, now it's a turtle. And now we say, oh, this is a problem. I wrote yikes, because it's at least not a frog, but to you and I, it's still a frog. And this seems like a problem uh, from a computer vision point of view. From a science point of view, you look at it like this, human perception does not seem to be sensitive to this change here. But this model clearly is, it's changing its output from turtle, from frog to turtle with this slight perturbation. And so what's going on? Well, scientifically, this means this model can't be right at some level. Again, all models are wrong, but clearly it's wrong in this particular regime. And it says, well, there's a mystery here. What needs to be changed? What's the next model gonna look like that's gonna make this less wrong, more aligned with human uh, perception and maybe also more aligned with human biology under the hood? And so that was a question that we were especially also interested in because we wanna always improve our models, not just accept them as done. And so we asked this question and we think I'm gonna show you, we have a, I don't think a complete answer, but we have a, a reasonable answer to this mystery at the moment. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of how we think about that. Again, not done, but gains in this front. So I'm gonna show you that next. The, the first, the part of this answer has actually three parts. The first part is that these robustification methods that I mentioned, that others develop to make models more robust exactly to these kinds of attacks. They produce new models, new parameters, if you will, new parameter settings. These models have limited, more limited attack opportunities than the model I showed you on the left. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that primate neural processing and perception is not as robust as we might like to believe it is. And that's the part where we think we've especially added value in showing you that. And I'll show you that in a minute, both at the neural level and the behavioral level. And it also requires a fair comparison of how you compare these systems. Now, this is a bit of an aficionado point. Maybe we can talk about it in a discussion. But the combination of those three things is almost close the gap between the leading models and their sensitivity to adversarial attack and the biological sensitivity to so-called adversarial attack. And I mean, this is all preview of what I'm going to take you through now. So um, that was just to tell you where I'm going. All right. So here's kind of now back to like how we got to those kind of answers. On the left is the brain's ventral stream that I introduced to you. That's the biology. That schematic means the biology that we're interested in modeling. The lower schematic is a vanilla model. This is a vanilla ANN model that we're going to take as a current leading model, or at the time was a current leading model of how that biology might be working in the way I outlined it for you a moment ago. Now, again, we can now make these direct comparisons 
at, at different levels. And here I'm going to focus on a comparison between the model's IT simulated neurons and the brain's IT actual neurons, because we knew this was an important processing point. We were already pretty adept at recording there. And so we focused on that as a, a sort of a way check to see what's going on with these adversarial attacks if we compare IT neurons and the biology with IT neurons in the, in the models that we were interested in. We here is led by work by Chong Guo, a postdoc in the lab at the time. So you can think of taking out one model neuron here schematically shown, there it is. You take out a, a biological neuron, there's one schematically shown, and we're gonna compare one to the other under adversarial attack uh, situations. And so now what we're doing is we're going to try to sort of target these neurons to make them drive their responses up and down, to make the response most deviate from whatever response they have to a particular image. So it's not an adversarial attack in the, in the sense of a, a behavioral level goal. It's an attack on each individual neuron, either in a model or in the biology. And we're going to compare the sensitivity of those two, two systems at that level. And the intuition you should have is that the biology is supposed to be much less sensitive than the, than the, than the brittle ANN models that are being used. And that's part of what the problem is. This was at least what we went into this work expecting to find, that the biology would be much less sensitive to these kinds of attacks. Than the, um, than, the, than the artificial neural networks. Now, that's not actually what we found, and I'll show you that here. So what did we do? In a monkey, we select some neural site to record. We have an electrode in a monkey brain, an IT cortex. We find the corresponding model IT neurons. So now we have a model that's meant to model those IT neurons. You can think of, find a neuron in the model's IT that looks like the neuron we're recording. The way we do that is measure a bunch of images and, and find the neuron that best, best lines up with those images. That's the simple way to think about it. Uh, and then we're gonna test on new images, what happens in the predictions, what happens with new sets of images. So here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix the image perturbation budget, the amount we're allowed to change the image, the amount of attack energy we have at our disposal, so to speak. We're gonna start from an arbitrary natural image and we're gonna vary that. This is, we're gonna have a bag of images. Here's just one image, we call it X. Um, and that's just a clean image shown on the right. That's an example. So it, it's a big vector, if you will, a pattern of photons. And now we're gonna, within the budget, we're gonna move around somewhere near that, that, that image point in pixel space, we're gonna use the model to find a perturbation that image that will give the largest predicted change in the IT neural response that is out of the model. Remember, we can't do this directly on the monkey neuron, but we can do this on the model neuron now and ask, find me a change that should change you um, neuron uh, the most. And if the model's a good model of the biology, then this is gonna give us hopefully a sort of similar response out of the monkey neuron. Here's what the change that it said to look for in this particular image that would change a particular neuron a lot. Um, and uh, you might barely see it. There's the change to the image. This should feel like what I showed you a minute ago, that this doesn't affect our perception very much. If I blow it up 10X, you can see there's actually some modification there. There it is. Okay, this is a small epsilon here, epsilon 2.5. Um, and we're gonna present each of these images to the monkey. We're gonna randomly interleave all the images. So you don't need to worry about adaptation effects or anything like that. And we're gonna go ahead and then compare what does the neuron respond to those two images? To you and I, they look identical, the images on the right, that crab and the lower crab. But we're gonna ask the neuron, what do you how do you respond to each of these? The original and the perturbed, there's the response of the neuron to X or the response of the neuron to X plus a perturbation. And we're gonna look for the absolute difference between those. And we're gonna do this for 100 arbitrary start images. So we're not just doing one crab image. And we're gonna average over that to give you a sense of the average sensitivity. Here's S, the sensitivity of a neuron for it. It's indexed by epsilon, the amount of budget at our availability here. And this is essentially a measure of the worst case sensitivity. We're gonna do this not just for one neural site, but for 21 sites that we happen to be recording from in this particular animal. Now, again, for the aficionados, you might've realized that, well, look, these are arbitrary units in a way. The biology has spikes per second on the right. The model neurons have whatever the activation values of these networks tend to be. We could, of course, do the same math shown here, but that doesn't mean S should be comparable to S without a units conversion. So we're normalizing by the, the range of the model and the biology over a set of natural images that give it sort of natural operating range defined here as a standard deviation over a set of natural images. This gives us a dimensionless quantity, this S tilde, which is now can be fairly compared to allow us to compare the model neurons and the biology neurons directly in a, in a dimensionless uh, space. Okay, hopefully if you buy all that, now we're just gonna show you the results. For the ML researchers in the, mo this is a slide I made that if you're an ML researcher interested in adversarial perturbations or that this is a slide for you. So this is, and then I'll do a neuroscience slide next. It's a slightly different slide. 
So if you're an animal researcher, these adversarial methods, they were much of them were developed by, uh, uh, by folks, again, not us. Alexander Mandre here at MIT was one of the leaders of this. He's a co-author on this paper you see here. I want you to orient to the plot now on the right. At the bottom is the amount of image budget. And you can see that's a log scale. And, you know, flip up pixel is shown there, a random pair of images shown on the right. It's a sort of hard to scale to have intuition about, but that's sort of why I'm orienting you to where that is. Um, most of research and robustness to these kind of slight perturbations here is shown on the region to the left. You see region studying robustness region research. We're focused on that blue zone that I'm blowing up on the right there. Okay, so this is much smaller than random pairs of images, like at least an order of magnitude smaller, uh, but it's sort of at the upper end of what's usually studied in adversarial research. Okay, back to the plot. The y-axis is that S tilde, the sensitivity. High numbers means you're very sensitive to perturbations around any arbitrary clean image. Low numbers means you do not. This is a log scale that you note here. There's a ResNet 50 architecture and there's its sensitivity. And you might go, well, that's a, it's a high number. I don't know, I haven't referenced it for you, but it's a pretty high number. I don't know, 10, it's, you know, one, one epsilon gives you this, this S tilde of 10. That may not mean much yet. I hope it will here in a moment. The absolute values don't matter much to us at, without this framing, but that's the vanilla model IT neuron. So that's like taking sample neurons out of these vanilla models that are modeling IT. And this is their sensitivity. Now, if you take neurons out of these more robustified models that I mentioned in brain score, which were some of the leading models on brain score, Here's their sensitivity. It's much lower. You can see it's like two orders of magnitude lower for the epsilon one if you focus on that. Um, and so you could say, well, that's actually kind of nice. That's what those techniques were developed to do. They essentially overtrain these networks to adversarial attacks to make them robust to those kinds of attacks. So it's essentially achieved the engineering goal. It's lowered it. And this is quantifying the amount it's achieved it as a function of epsilon. Okay. The interesting part, if you're a machine learning researcher, is maybe not that, which you may already know, but this, which is that when we measure the biological IT neurons, again, using these comparison methods, that's where the IT neurons individually sit. So this is, we think of anything, a lower bound estimate of the biological neurons, because we don't have an actual way to attack them directly. We're using the models as a surrogate. Um, so that's a lower bound estimate. You can see it's already, if anything, slightly higher. I think it's about the same as the robustified model neurons given error bars. Uh, but this should tell you like those robustification model neuro technique techniques have already moved the network into a state where its internals, at least at the level of IT, are similar to the sensitivity of the internals of the biological system at the single unit level. Remember, it's neurons as a group that give rise to the behavior. And this is showing it's working at the single unit level. Okay, that's that sort of tells you something from the, the machine learning point of view. Now from the neuroscience researcher motivated point of view, here's another way to look at this result. What is this result saying? It's like, well, here's here's a response of a, of a neuron in IT cortex to a couple of images at the top from one category we call the preferred category that gives a lot of spikes. The non-preferred category gives less spikes. Those were fine by just searching among a bunch of categories. For those who don't know, neuroscience background here is that the difference in spike rate between those two boxes, the blue and the red, is what's thought to underlie the behavioral reports that I showed you earlier, that the patterns that you were able to extract and say, hey, the monkey's going to report it's a, it's, a, it's a valve and not a dog or a dog and not a valve. It's that spike rate difference that's underlying how we think the animal's reporting those differences. Okay, so with that context, now you can see that I'm gonna make with the model's guidance, a tiny perturbation to the images on the left. Again, it's epsilon 2.5. And you can see how many more spikes I can generate out of this single IT neural site. I can make its response, if anything, even slightly higher than the response you see at the top. So that gives you some context here is that I'm not changing the perceptual category to you and I on the left, but I'm able to drive this neuron as if I'm changing its view of the perceptual category. And we can quantify that. The red line is the level of perceptual category flip for a, a neuron. Um, and here's the kind of at about epsilon 2.5 to 5, you can see there's 20 some neural sites. Almost all of them have reached a kind of flip point that we've sort of driven them to an activation state as if we've changed the preferred category to them. So that's a very large movement in the neural response. This is something that neuroscientists really didn't think was true or capable of these neurons at this level of the system. They thought, again, they would be quite robust to these kinds of modifications. And this shows with model guidance, we can find image changes that previously we would have never been able to find. We would have been guessing at random pixel movements, but now with models, we're finding specific image changes that can reveal that neurons have these hidden sensitivity avenues that we didn't know about before. And this is exposing that one example of that in IT cortex. 
Okay, so that was an unexpected discovery. I just took you through that. In the interest of time, I'm just going to jump ahead. This we might call this a failure mode, but it could be, you know, it's a biological bug, if you will. Maybe it shouldn't have happened. But later, I'm going to say maybe this is an opportunity that we should think about in, in doing some health interventions. And I'll return to that if I have time at the end. Let me quickly, in the interest of time, because I see we're running a little short, I'm going to now go to sh shift to the next part of this talk, which is motivated by what I set up here that the IT population. Remember, I sort of showed you individual sites. What's going on here? Our perception seems like it's like robust to these changes, even when you were looking at those images I showed you. But the neurons under the hood, I'm telling you, can be dramatically changed by slight perturbations, adversarially driven perturbations. Maybe what's going on is the population as a whole can't be modified. And it's that whole population that, of course, of course supports our behavioral percepts or our reported percepts. And just individual IT neurons is a nice parlor trick, but really the whole population can't be moved. Maybe that's what's going on. That's something we wondered about. Um, we had some evidence against that. One piece of evidence is that it wasn't as if all the IT neurons are moving in the same direction all at once. Um, it, it, we have in power ability to control them individually to some degree. And that's what's kind of schematized on this slide. This sort of heavy diagonal is all I want you to see here. Uh, and I don't have time to take you through it other than to say like, well, that might be part of the explanation. It's something we're working on now, but we don't, we're not, we're not entirely convinced that that's the explanation of why our sensitivity seems to be much more robust to the, than the individual neurons. Another might be like, well, remember this model of like linear decoders that live between IT and the percept, maybe that's an inaccurate model. Of course, it's just a model. There's a, maybe more fancy mechanisms that live in the brain between IT neurons and the actual category report that we perceive or our perception, if you will. Um, that's a possibility. Or maybe the human perception is really not really quite as robust as many of us like to believe it actually is. Um, and really, it's these are not exclusive. All three of these things could be partly true, but these are the areas that we, we've been working next to sort of say, well, what's going on here? And when I say we, now I'm going to shift to measuring area three. Area three was the easiest for us to work on right away. So we started with that, just measure human robustness to these kinds of perturbations. Um, and this was work done by Guy Gazib and Michael Lee, shown, shown at the bottom, and I'll show you that next. So this is the second part of this, this last section of the talk. We're now doing behavior level measurements. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do similar perturbations, but instead of measuring neural responses in IT cortex, we're going to measure behavioral responses in humans. What we're trying to do is perturb the images to change the perceptual state of the humans using that neuroscientific model or our leading neuroscientific model. And we're going to, again, do this within a budget limit on the magnitude of allowable perturbation. So here's how this goes. In effect, you have a model, you have a behavioral output of the model, you have a bunch of, you know, of logic outputs that might say, what's the probability of, the, uh, of a, being a dog, a crab, or a frog, or in this case, 10 different categories. And this image it thinks is mostly a frog, and that would be the sort of stated behavioral report of the model and what it would predict the human would say in this case. Um, but you say, let's make change the images just like the original adversary attack to make it think it's a crab or something. So now we're going to work back through the model just using the adversary attack methods that were already developed by others. And what, what just to give you a sense of, again, what's going on, you've got a point in pixel space and image space. You're working within a budget envelope. You can take steps guided by the model and you eventually stay on that budget envelope and you find an image perturbation that's within the envelope, but still produces a large change in the output of the model's behavioral report. In this case, it's decided to report crab instead of frog, similar to what I motivated at the beginning. That's the perturbation that we're going to apply. We're going to do that. There's the perturbation. Go ahead and apply that. And now we're going to test human sensitivity to those same perturbations. We're not the first, by the way, to measure humans in this regime, um, but I, I think, um, uh, I think, um, I'll show you, some, I think we've done this in a more, more systematic way than been done before. And we've done it with longer time viewings and we've done it with these more recent robustification models. So here's the um, here's how we tested humans. There's a bunch of humans. We're gonna test them. They initiate a trial. They get an image like the one shown there for about 200 milliseconds. It turns out the viewing time doesn't matter that much to the results I'm gonna show you, but that's a natural viewing time is motivated at the top. So we're not doing speeded masking or anything like that. Just present it for a natural viewing time. And then the subject's reporting among nine categories with a push button shown on the right. So I say we're measuring the perceptual state. We're really measuring a projection of the human's perceptual state on a nine-dimensional space, if you will. And they're just going to give us those uh, that, that number, that output there. And we're going to kind of quantify that as what I call perception next. All right, here's the main result. Perceptual disruption that results from attacking humans with different image perturbations. These are the summary results. So perceptual disruption is on the y-axis. High disruption is at the top. Low disruption is at the bottom. 
The budget is now going to be varied at the bottom. The amount of pixels we get to move, the L2 norm, which is epsilon pixel movement of the perturbation. Everything I'm going to show you here is in this so-called low regime, what we call low regime less than 30, which you might notice is slightly higher than the neural regime I was showing you earlier. The model that we use to guide the design different attacks is now going to be shown at the top. If we use no model, that is if we make random movements in pixel space, I'm going to show you that first. Here's what humans do with a budget of 30. This probably shouldn't be surprising to you. If you make arbitrary movements, humans go, I don't really notice any effect. I'm going to still keep reporting the category that I was reporting as a way to read this slide. So it's a flat line. They're essentially immune to, to budgets less than 30 for random directed attacks against humans. It doesn't change their category per step in that nine-way test. Now, what about if we use a directed attack? Here, directed by a vanilla ANN model. Again, some of the initial models of the ventral stream were these vanilla ANN models. They're what's motivated a lot of this work. What we see here is that if we make a perturbation attack, now with the vanilla model, uh, it strongly beats up on the model. The model flips its output state, 100% errors with pixels budgets of around one. Um, but if we look at the humans, they're almost immune, almost completely immune to this. Again, nearly a flat line here. And this huge gap in robustness was actually what I motivated before at the beginning. This is just the quantification of what I showed you at the beginning is that, hey, we don't seem to be sensitive to this, but models are. So this is just now quantifying that for you. And I, I mentioned prior work. Here's some example work from Nurips here, from El, El Sayed et al, who, who basically showed there were slight effects in mass conditions in this regime here. You can see a little hint of something happening in these uh, human perception here. But here's the most striking result. We're now using these robustified leading brain scored model of these kinds of, 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 of the ventral stream to direct the attack. So now these are gonna be pixel perturbations guided by a new model or robustified ANN model of the ventral stream. Now here's the result. So the surprising thing here is that humans can be massively moved. You can see them flipping to errors, if you will, changing almost getting to nearly 100% errors of pixel budgets of less than 30. These are massive shifts in human perception that are guided by these models now. And that's what's shown in black. As you see, compare the black, it's like sloping up dramatically relative to the flat lines you see on the left side. Also, if you look at the robustified model and its surrogate test model, which is the appropriate test, you'll see that it is, it is similarly affected. It's a little bit more affected by the human. You can see it here. But that gap, that gap in red between the black and the model, between the data and the human and the model and the, and the color is nearly closed now. And so um, just to give you a sense of this, robustified models, here's what these attacks might look like visually, what you might look at those images and say, well, that looks like a dog and a seal and a grasshopper, when in fact, those original images were a primate, a dog and a frog. And those, these are examples of the, to give you intuition that these, these of what you can see, why you can just do armchair psychophysics, if you will, and this will strongly affect your perceptual report. Again, guided by those robustified models. The vanilla models, if you look at them, you look at that, it looks like a blurry, primate, dog, and frog. And that was kind of, again, reminiscent of what I motivated at the beginning. Okay, so that's just a visual of what I was showing you quantified in the data. What's also interesting is we can drive this around. It's not just disrupt your attack, not just make this dog not dog, but we can make it into a crab or a bird or a cat or an insect. And we can do that quite well. In this case, a nine category test. You can see our, per our performance there is 60% with those models. Whereas the vanilla models are on the floor, you couldn't do this at all. So again, not perfect within a pixel budget of 30, but already quite good, which is which is also really quite interesting and powerful. There's some visuals on that. In the interest of time, I'll jump ahead to kind of get to conclusion here. Okay, so just a big picture, what everybody might have thought before this research is that, hey, if you pick an arbitrary image, nearby that image, human category percepts are quite robust. That is everything in there is green, everything's gonna be called a frog. Um, and uh, instead, what these results showed us is that nearby any image, in this case, an image of a frog, you can find these little holes, if you will, wormholes, we call them, where you can disrupt the category per set. Those can be found by certain types of models. In this case, I was showing you robustified models can find these wormholes. The vanilla models here shown in blue, they, they make movements which are, go. they still would say in frog land, they don't find those wormholes so dramatically or so accurately, not really at all. And so this is a visual of what's going on if you think about the high dimensional space of pixels. Um, moreover, the names of those wormholes, their color, their category, if you will, it's a dog or it's a crab or it's a frog or it's a, it's a house, whatever category you have, they're properly named. That is when the model says it's going to be a dog, the human also says it's going to be a dog. And so it's not just that there's disruption, but the pattern, the exact type of disruption is aligned with the model. Okay, that's what, the take home I want you to take from all of this is that we can now use, the answer to this mystery is that these robustified methods produce new models that limit the attack opportunities 
The remaining attack opportunities are ones that humans are, and neurons are also sensitive to. And when you make a fair comparison, the gap is not quite closed, but almost closed. Okay, so that's a summary of where this work sits. Um, I want to sort of kind of just high level these, as I said this already, the neuroscientific models of the ventral stream, they've revealed these failures, if you will, bugs or maybe opportunities in both the neural responses that I showed you first. And also they show that there's like shifts in human perception that they can point to um, that prior models weren't able to point to. So those are the two recent results that I've taken you through here. In the last two minutes or so, I sort of want to sort of remind you that this is a bigger picture goal, not just about vision and not just about adversarial attacks. Here, the AI impact um, for the vision side would have been like, hey, robustification methods are one way to make things more human-like, but there's a big neuroscience and cognitive science impact from doing this kind of strategy. And I'm gonna sort of give you an example of this here. Um, and just the last minute here, I'm gonna speculate on a future human health application from this kind of work. So if you bear with me here, and I realize we're just about out of time, um, this basic idea is if you have a if you have a model like this one, imagine you can apply precise imperceptible modulations to your video feed, where you might be able to produce precise modulations deep inside your brain, modulating neurons like I showed you in IT cortex. And so far, we've tested this in IT and V4. I didn't show you that work in V4. It's here on the side if you're interested. We showed that you can make behavioral level movements. You can shift human categories by making small perturbations to the images. That's the work I just outlined for you there. And that was recently published if you're interested in that. What we're thinking about now is could we use this to possible beneficial applications beyond just shifting your percept? And just to help you understand why we think about this, remember these parts of the brain as I interested in the, introduced in the outline, they project to other parts of the brain. For instance, basal ganglia involved in decision and action, perirhinal cortex involved in memory, prefrontal cortex involved in task control. And another area called the amygdala involved in things like emotional state and anxiety and mood disorders. This area is implicated in those areas. And it's thought that if neurons in this area could be precisely modulated, it might lead to improvements in, for instance, uh, effective mental state, such as anxiety or mood. So Alina Peters showed here is busy recording in monkeys now, and we're trying to extend our models to allow us to put in slight perturbations to the images that might modulate specifically amygdala neurons without modifying perceptual states, we hope, so that you might imagine living your daily life in your perceptual state, but having a slightly modified input to your amygdala, which might be used as a non-invasive treatment, for instance, with AR glasses. This is the kind of things we're dreaming about using these models at now, and we're doing initial tests to see if that might be even possible. Um, with that, I'm going to just remind you that human intelligence is a very broad goal. I've just been talking about vision and core recognition. Many of my colleagues are working well beyond that in other areas in the same style of building models that can extend to other parts of intelligence and have similar payoff application goals in terms of AI systems, educational goals, health goals like the one I just mentioned, and really ways to even recognize how to avoid social conflict as we build models of how humans socially interact. And um, with that, I know I'm over time. I'm going to stop and end. And if there's any time for questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. This is this was a really really impressive uh, talk, to be honest. So, uh, well, uh, uh, time for question, please. So you are free to to add whatever you want. Any question? Go ahead, Rocio. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like first to thank, uh, it was a really interesting talk. It's really nice to see or uh, to listen, <laughs> in this case, uh, to something a little bit out of our comfort zone. So it's a, it's a great thing to, to have these seminars. Um, I am very curious about the uh, type of neural networks. So you talk about uh, vanilla A N N, and I work with spiky neural networks. And I, I, I'm curious about if you thought about uh, trying different types of neural networks, more similar, more biologically plausible, uh, to see if there is a big difference uh, between them. Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, we would love the network to be spiking and then match to all the spiking details of the brain. We sort of chose this level of abstraction and sort of mean rate. You know, we usually think about mean rate networks and these current ANNs are just modeling the mean rate in our hands. Um, and, and, but you're right, they're not fully biological in that goal. Um, 
it's harder, as you know, to build spiking networks and then make them perform in all these ways. Um, so that's kind of operationally why we've been in this regime. As you, you notice, we're still getting a lot of traction with these sort of, again, no models are perfect. This one clearly is, no models are right. What's the George Box quote? But some are useful. This model level is already still quite useful in a lot of the ways I've described. So that's why we're still sort of staying in that space for the moment, not because we're not interested in the spiking networks, but because we're like, well, there's a lot of things still to do at this level of abstraction of mean rates. But I would love it if you or others would come up with a spiking network that would be a model of the ventral stream. You submit it on BrainScore, it would like be the leading model and be even better. That would be my dream. <laughs> but it's been hard. That gap still seems like it's still hard to cross. But I'm I'm glad that folks like you are interested in that. I am interested in it too. It's just not that's much harder engineering, and so we haven't done that as much for partly those reasons, which are, you know, not the best reasons, but it's just practically harder to do. Um, so. So I hope I hope that's it's not a great answer to the question. Other than like keep going and, and, and maybe look at the BrainScore platform. And if you had suggestions of here's a kind of measure on BrainScore that would reveal the power of a spiking network, please put that up as a metric that will push the field to build such models. That that's kind of would drive them to not just explain the mean rates, but something about the spike timing patterns as reproducible. Something that only a spiking network can do. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the other way that I could try to engage on that kind of wearing my empirical hat and my BrainScore community hat. Well, wearing our model building hat, I think is we're almost like consumers of models at this point. Like it's hard to build these models. And like, again, we, I'm a neuroscientist, empirical neuroscientist by training. So we're mostly focused on the benchmarks and brain score. And we're hoping someone like you or others might come up with these next models and that the community will then benefit from that. My students do things like modify eight ends and they do some, some things around there, but we're mostly, again, focused on the comparison of whatever the leading models are against the, the brain data. And we think that's a productive place to be for the field because not everybody can be good at everything. So again, just give you a sense of where our niche is at the moment. Oh, great. Helps. Challenge yeah. accepted. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Great, thank you for coming to the talk and thank you for the question. Okay, we have two questions in the, in the, on the chat from Darren. Uh, the first question was, how close do you think we are able to be using this technology for medical purposes such as treating depression? Um, the other question is um, the concern about adversarial attacks with hidden data in images from a consumer business viewpoint, managing their website, for, for example, what practical advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, it's really all, you know, all scientific understanding, in this case, understanding of visual processing can lead to uses that are maybe beneficial of the ones I was talking about of like depression relief or anxiety reduction potentially beneficial modulations, but could also be used for things that might be considered less less desirable from a human society point of view. You know, advertising is a bit in a gray zone. I'm not sure people have different views on that. Um, I certainly don't like the language of the phrase adversarial attack. I did not dream that up. That's computer vision. <laughs> I would say beneficial modulations of what, when we think about a human. Uh, but the question of how to, um, how to uh, manage policy is one that we're gonna all have to work on together. Uh, we are things that we're doing is always with regard again to the goal of like uh, understanding what's happening in terms of the biology and then trying to focus on how we can make improvements to human health. Uh, we are certainly not ourselves pursuing those other applications of advertising other things, but it is true that these same models could be used to start to do those things. And um, that's a broader discussion bigger than my lab as to how we as a as a community, as a human community, manage that those policy goals. And I think that will have to be through various forms of regulation and so forth. But um, I think that's all I can say on that at the moment, other than our goals are to improve human health. Thank you. More, more questions? Well, I have, a, I have a, a small question. I don't know if it's a... Uh weird question or or not because i'm i'm far from from i'm not an expert in this in this field right but uh, you show you show us that uh, you are able to change the i mean with a small small perturbation on on the images right you are able to to make the model to to fail right whereas the human perception has no i mean these images or these images with the perturbation don't have any impact on the human perception, right? But, but, uh, uh, but it it really has in the uh, in the model, right? I was thinking more in ten, in, in instead of using a small perturbation on, on the images, uh, 
if you have tried or if you have any idea, if you change just the background, right? So for instance, you have a frog, right? But you change the background and instead of water, you have sand or I don't know, to say something, something silly, right? So I, I suppose that it has no impact uh, on the model, right? But maybe it could have a, a, a huge impact on the human perception because, it, well, it depends on the time you are looking at the image, right? But if, if you have a more few time, right, for, for watching the, the image, maybe your perception of the of what you are watching is completely different. Whereas maybe for a model, for, for a, a computer, right, it's, it has no, no impact, right? So I don't know, it's a, a silly question. I don't know if you have tried or if you thought about it. Well, no, it's not a silly question to ask of like, where are the gaps between humans and models? And I think that's exactly the right question. So I guess I maybe wasn't very clear when I, like our goal is to find a model that looks aligned with the humans. Like it, everything, every time the model makes a change in its output, then the human better make the same change in its output. Otherwise it's a bad science model. That's how we think about a model. And what I'm showing you on this slide on the right, you can think of this, there's two models here. There's a blue model and there's a red model. And the blue model does exactly what you said. It, when you try to give it a certain input, it generates an input. And when you use its surrogate model, it basically is sensitive to that attack. It will shift its output, but the human does not. And that's the black line. So there's a gap, a difference, as you said. But the model on the right, they're not identical, but they're very close. So whenever the model says, hey, my output's changing, the human's also saying my output's changing too. That's the basic summary of this result. Now, not exactly. Are pretty close. So you would say the red model is a better scientific model. Is it a better AI model? Is it a better you know technology model? That's a different question. But in terms of its alignment with humans, it's pretty good. And it it's that's the kind of whole point of this is like that robustified model is a pretty good model of human visual perception in these the regimes that we've tested here. Not perfect, but far better than the blue model used to be. And so so does that mean it's great model? I mean it's better. Is it done? No. Is it spiking? No. You know there's many things it doesn't do. But in terms of its perceptual alignment, it doesn't have the problem that you sort of mentioned there. It doesn't have a very strong version of that problem. And that's true of both the neural level and the behavioral level. And so that's the main thing I want to tell you is like that model is actually making it hard for us to say the model's wrong in those measures. And that to me is scientific progress. And then you can turn that into like, well, if you think it's good, you can start to think about applications like health. If the model's bad, then of course you have to work on it. The blue model is bad, but now the red model is not so bad is a summary here. But we usually don't do the intuitions of, is it the background? I know that's very tempting. We usually ask the model to tell us where the models are gonna say, you know, something strange is gonna happen or two models differ from each other. And that's sort of a scientific hypothesis comparison. We have two models, where do they predict that they're gonna make a different prediction? And then, the then we're gonna test that on the human to say, okay, this model is then more correct or not. And that would be a, a hill climb amongst alternative models to eventually find the one that's most aligned with the biology at the levels that you're measuring, in that case, human behavior. It's hard to do that intuitively using backgrounds. That's the sort of, it's it's easier to just let the models kind of guide the experiments. So almost like auto science, that's I think where the field's gonna head, already is heading. Less about human intuition and more about model guided experiments. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Lexi. yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I said the background because I was thinking on the context, right? Because sometimes the context, not only in images, but in I don't know in talking or writing the 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 context of something is important right so for instance here in Spain uh, we have some words right in Spanish that depending on the context it has a meaning or, or other right so I suppose it's the same in images and it's, yeah it's a uh, our way it's uh, the question was related to that right if, there is any yeah, and, 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 and that you're in some sense saying that cognition is broader than just vision. I mean, the way we're limiting context is shown here. So we're giving the humans, they know they're going to see an image and they're going to get nine choices. And that's the context, right? You don't say, hey, right now you're busy shopping for you know groceries and you give them a whole bunch of background, you know, that then, you know, that you could preset their goals and that and that would be what you call context. And that might change some of these patterns here. But we're focused on something a little more basic right now and not those full contextual effects that you're mentioning, which certainly are gonna emerge at some point with more advanced behavioral testing. And the models that we have right now are, have no way to, to manage those. The kind of models I've been showing you would never deal with those at all. And so we're aligning our human testing. We're bringing our humans sort of down to the level of the model, if you will. We're not yet engaging those harder questions because we know the models aren't even ready to engage them. 
or they, they weren't even ready to engage this, but now they're ready to engage this. So maybe now those questions be, can become more forwarded. That's sort of forward looking work. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. So last question, uh, Angel. Okay, if you can talk, just write. <laughs> Can you write the question or, or I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, I'm going, I'm trying to, uh, Angel. I don't know if I, I can unmute you or, or not. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying, but. Uh... I can't. Okay, okay. so what? <laughs> uh, well, if you want to send a question by email, you saw my email at the end, to carlo at mit.edu. I'm happy to answer yeah, it. Sure. And sure. if anybody who is interested in this and wants to chat offline, um, just drop me an email. I could Zoom with you if you okay. put my email at the, again at the end. It was to carlo at mit.edu. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. If you feel free to email me. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. So, well, uh, that's all. Uh, again, thank you so much, Jean. It was, uh, for me, it was a really understanding talk. Uh, again, I'm not an uh, expert in this field, but it was, uh, I was uh, engaged uh, of your talk for sure. It was, it was really, uh, really interesting, right? So, well, thank you so much again for, for being with us. Um, and thank you everybody for, for coming to the, for coming to the town, right? So thank you. thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.